Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to you. Our guest speaker today will be introduced by the Dean of the John F. Kennedy School of Government and the Provost of Harvard University, Mr. Albert Carnesale. Mr. Carnesale has also been the acting president of Harvard University. Mr. Carnesale. Thank you, Raul. It's, uh, I want to welcome everybody, and especially uh, a welcome to the uh, 1995 graduating class of the John F. Kennedy School of Government. That's right. You can applaud yourself. As you know, the, the Kennedy School has a special mission. It's to prepare leaders for public service, public service in government and in other institutions in democratic societies. And leadership is a largely, but not entirely, personal trait. Uh, most of our students arrive at the Kennedy School already having exhibited leadership, uh, starting sometimes before high school, in high school, and certainly by college. And in your time here, you uh, study leadership sometimes formally in classes, and all of you uh, informally by interacting with each other and by interacting with the many leaders, uh, political, academic, and business leaders who pass through the Kennedy School during your time. But as you know, your education is not over, um, and it's also not over in the realm of leadership. And if we start to think of what are the major issues that our nation faces, that will require leadership, compassionate, visionary leadership to deal with, certainly high on anybody's list, has to be racial issues in the United States. So you might consider this not only in a sense as the Kennedy School's commencement speech, where the speaker is selected by the graduates, but also as your last class on a most important topic of public policy, one that's going to be crucial for our nation. Our speaker, as you know, is a member of the Harvard University faculty, Cornell West. Now, to appreciate Cornell West's perspective, it's useful to recall some of the influences on his life. Not all, Cornell, you don't have to worry. Um, the Baptist church of his family and his youth and its role in black culture, the radicalizing influence of the Black Panthers when he was a student in Sacramento, and as he himself has written, a biography of Teddy Roosevelt that he borrowed from a bookmobile when he was just eight years old. Uh, young Cornel West felt an affinity with President Roosevelt because they both had suffered from asthma. He read how Roosevelt had overcome his asthma, went to Harvard, and became a great speaker. So at eight years old, before he knew where Harvard was, or perhaps what Harvard was, Cornell West decided that he was going to go to Harvard. He graduated from Harvard magna cum laude in 1973 and went on to Princeton University for graduate work. Completed his PhD there, joined the Princeton Faculty of Religion, and rapidly became one of the most distinguished scholars in his field. Last fall, Cornell West came to Harvard as a professor of the philosophy of religion at the Divinity School and simultaneously as a professor of Afro-American studies in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, where he's affiliated with the W.E. Du Bois Institute for African American Research. He's an author of nine books on religion, philosophy, ethics, and race, including the recent bestsellers, Race Matters, and Jews and Blacks, Let the Healing Begin, the latter of which he is co-author with Michael Lerner. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Cornell West. Well, indeed, what a pleasure to be here. Indeed, indeed. 
Now it is more than a delight and pleasure. It's an honor, a privilege, and a blessing. I'd like to thank Brother Rahu Sur for his kindness and, and leadership as well. And I'd like to thank Dean Provost Brother Al Carnesal for his leadership. I'd like to thank the hardworking and high quality faculty and staff of this grand institution. I'd like to thank the indescribably loving and sacrificial relatives who supported the graduates. <laughs> and last but not least, the marvelous, the magnificent class of 1995, the graduates of Kennedy School of Government. Let's give them another hand, please. Let's say one of the, the more exciting moments in my own undergraduate career was when I was actually awarded a uh, fellowship from the Institute of Politics when I was a freshman and went back to Sacramento, California and wrote a thesis on machine politics under the influence of Professor Martin Kielsen. And when I handed it in, in in the fall, they said, I think it's best for you to study philosophy. I said, that's right. <laughs> I said, oh, you mean like law schools, these uh, schools of government sharpen and narrow the mind? They said, no, it's just that it wasn't rigorous enough. I said, I understand. And I went on to uh, try to meet that challenge because I think, in fact, that school of government here at Harvard, the Kennedy School of Government, and most importantly, the emphasis, the stress on public service is something that is so badly needed in these dark and difficult times. But I stand before you this glorious yet slightly rainy afternoon as but a small part of a great and grand tradition. I want to talk about that tradition today. It's a tradition of struggle, a struggle for decency and dignity, a struggle for freedom and democracy. The great T.S. Eliot, no lover of modernity or democracy, but 1910 graduate of Harvard, one of the towering artists of our day, still provides insight when he wrote in his famous essay of 1919, Tradition and the Individual Talent. He said, tradition is not something you inherit. If you want it, you must obtain it with great labor, sacrifice, toil, engagement. And when I think some of the embodiments of this tradition that I'm talking about, a sojourner truth, a Harriet Tubman, Ida B. Wells, Barnett, A. Philip Randolph, a Martin King, a Ella Baker, a Fannie Lou Hamer, one cannot but be humbled by the standards of courage and vision and sacrifice that they set. Oh, when I think for white sister like Lydia Maria Child, you recall that famous classic of hers written in 1833, appeal in favor of that class of Americans called Africans, or her attempt to care for the family of Brother John Brown, who was executed in December of 1859, to keep alive a focus on this vicious legacy of white supremacy in the American ex democratic experiment. Or Brother Elijah Lovejoy, another white brother, who was shot standing front of his house in Alton, Illinois in 1837, owing to his abolitionist work. One thinks of old Miles Horton. I hope, in fact, at some point in the career of the graduates, they read The Long Haul. Miles Horton, known to some fellow citizens as old white cracker, but known to freedom fighters as one of the towering prophetic figures of our time, the founder of Highlander Center that would help train as he was trained a Rosa Parks. Stokely Carmichael, or Diane Nash, or Robert Moses, a whole wave of freedom fighters from Old Highland descent way out in Gut Bucket, Tennessee. One could go on and on. Rabbi David Einhorn dragged out of his synagogue in Baltimore owing to his unequivocal identification with this same tradition. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel standing with Martin King, building on that rich prophetic tradition of Judaism, a Grace Paley, secular Jewish sister, a Grace Boggs, Asian sister, Russell Means, red brother, brother Harvey Milk, gay brother, lesbian sister like Audrey Lord. The tradition that I'm talking about has always been a tradition to claim whosoever will let him or her come if you're willing to make certain moral choices to make certain political commitments and willing to pay the price and bear the cost. 
because you're going to have to cut against the grain. This tradition of struggle has no monopoly on goodness or truth or virtue because it is inhabited by cracked vessels like ourselves. But they try to muster enough courage and vision to keep track, not just of white supremacy, not just the male supremacy, not just the vast economic inequality, not just the homophobia, not just the ecological abuse, but to force America especially. Henry James once called American civilization a hotel civilization. The fusion of the market and the home, the market with its liquidity and mobility, the home with its surety and security and motherhood with the patriarchal tilt that it has had, but still with its riches. To force a hotel civilization to come to terms with the problem of evil. And how difficult it has been in this land of the sentimental and the melodramatic to want to fully grapple with the forms of undeserved harm and unjustified suffering and unmerited pain, the problem of evil, even in Oklahoma, tragedy. See, the response is more evil as an event rather than evil as processes imminent within our history, imminent within human history, and yet our great artists remind us Herman Melville, William Faulkner, Elizabeth Bishop, John Coltrane, Tony Morris, Tennessee Williams. Our great artists remind us, if we don't come to terms with the problem of evil, then this precarious yet precious experiment in democracy cannot remain afloat. And it may seem abstract, but in our day, we see it in the concrete lived experience every moment. It's true to talk about race in America then opens us up, not just to talking about the plight of black and brown brothers and sisters in chocolate cities. It's not just to talk about some individual prejudice or particular form of discrimination that has been operative in our history. It's raising deeper issues. That's why it's so difficult to talk about in America. Because you have to raise the question of who am I? How did I come to be what I am? How do I deal with these unconscious and non-rational forces that inhabit my dreams as well as my thoughts? To explore what the great James Baldwin called that wilderness inside of each and every one of us. And our unwillingness, our reluctance to want to respond to that famous maxim of Franz Kafka, namely that education texts ought to serve as axes that break the frozen ice within us. How difficult it is to want to deal with the repercussions and ramifications of those presuppositions that need to be unsettled and those prejudices that need to be unstiffened. I love that wonderful word of William James unstiffened, loosened, shaken, as it were. To talk then about race in America is to take us to the very heart, core, and soul, what it means to be American, what it means to be modern in the new world, what it means to be human in the new world. It is not a ghettoized issue. It's not a marginal issue. That's one of the things I love about the Department of Afro-American Studies here at Harvard. You see, Brother Skip Gates and Anthony Appiah and Evelyn Higginbotham and a host of others, they understand that Afro-American Studies is not some peripheral study. It takes us to the very heart and core of modernity. Race itself, that construct first put forward in the human adventure in 1684 by Francois Bernier. No one thought of defining humankind by appealing to physical characteristics and then making certain inferences about their intelligence and beauty and moral character. No one conceived of this until 200 years after the commencement of the age of Europe, 1492, expulsion of Jews and Muslims and the encounter, Brother Christopher, with some indigenous people in the New World. 
almost 200 years later, it considered maybe, in fact, there's something called races in the human race. And Linnaeus would institutionalize it and canonize it in his natural system, written about with such insight and perspicacity by my colleague Stephen Gould. And Buffon and Blumenbach. And lo and behold, this construct, which as we know has no scientific content whatsoever, this legal construct, this cultural construct, which has had such deleterious and devastating consequences, we must remind our post-structuralist friends that constructs have consequences <laughs> in the world, would fundamentally shape the making of the modern world. Who can understand European colonialism and imperialism without white supremacist ideology and practices? Who could understand the last empire in this barbaric century in which over 200, 200 million fellow human beings have been murdered in the name of some pernicious ideology? Levels of brutality, and butchery, unprecedented in the human adventure in this century. And yet, at the end of the 20th century, 219 years into the experiment of American democracy, we still have to deal with the consequences of this construct called race and white supremacy. John J. Chapman said it well when he said white supremacy was like a serpent wrapped around the legs of the table upon which the founding fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence. It haunted America then, and it still haunts us. This is why, for me, any talk about race must begin with the great W.B. Du Bois, another Harvard graduate. Harvard has no monopoly on wisdom, I should say. He's trotting out all of these towering figures who have graced the halls of this place. The great Du Bois writes in 1903, in order to come to terms with race in America, we first begin with art. He begins with poetry, the crying of water in his classic text, The Souls of Black Folk. Arthur Simmons himself, fascinating literary critic, mediocre poet, fascinating figure, <laughs> published a poem September 28, 1900, committed suicide two months later, overwhelmed by the meaninglessness and hopelessness of life. In the poem that Du Bois invokes called The Crying of Water, 13 lines, eight references to cries, guttural cries, wrenching moans, visceral groans, primal screams, echoing the cries and screams and moans and groans of those Africans who jumped off or were tossed off slave ships. The transatlantic slave trade that sits at the center of the age of enlightenment in Europe. And we can't understand the age of Europe without that dialectical understanding of the great contributions to humanity and the, the ugly crimes against humanity occurring at the same time. You all recall the dedication of Toni Morrison's great classic of 1987, Beloved. 60 million or more, as a conservative estimate of those, the number of Africans who, were, who died during that transatlantic slave trade. To begin with those cries and moans and groans and screams for Du Bois, it's not to call for self-pity, it's simply to acknowledge that in fact, maybe that sits at the very center of the human condition. Maybe in a hotel civilization, we need to take time to not just listen to, but try to raise the question, what is the meaning of such sadness and sorrow and suffering? These scars and bruises and wounds, blood, sweat, and tears, what the great Edwin Gibbon called this human register of crimes and follies and misfortunes which constitute so much of human history. The voice then moves on to lyrical, musical bars. He refuses to print the lyrics of a Negro spiritual. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, 
Hallelujah. Where did that last line come from? You can imagine that's another lecture, another seminar. Right. Human ecstasy, black ecstasy, human joy, black joy in the midst of such pain and grief, in the midst of such agony and anguish, such heartache and heartbreak. Where does it come from? Where do we muster the resources requisite to steel struggle against overwhelming odds? Reminds me of those three groans and two moans in the greatest short story ever written by Leo Tolstoy, The Death of Ivan Illich. Where does it come from, even in the realization that his life has been false, but he begins to shift and realizes that, lo and behold, that these human limits can leave us empty. And yet, the songs, the voices of these enslaved human beings provides us with a lesson, namely that no matter how bad the situation is, one never allows misery to have the last word, even if all one can do at the moment is sing a song or crack a smile. It's human spirit at work. But the boy says, let's get specific, let's get concrete. And it begins with his prose. Between me and the other world, there's an unasked question. Most of my fellow citizens evade it, avoid it, they flutter around it, have tremendous difficulty rightly framing it. And instead of approaching it courageously, they pull back and say, I know an excellent colored man in my town. Not wanting to grapple with the question. The question is what? How does it feel to be a problem? How does it feel in a civilization that has put such high premium on problem solving, on being practical and pragmatic? We hear every January our ability to solve any problem, no limit, no constraints. That's America predicated on a promise with tremendous heroic energies to solve any problem. And yet, here's a people, among others, whose very embodiment is a problem because their humanity has been so thoroughly problematized. The vicious, everyday attacks on black beauty, trying to convince black folk, among others, they have the wrong hips and lips and noses and hair texture and skin pigmentation. That's bodily, that's visceral. There might be some brothers and sisters of African descent who try to de-Africanize or re-Europeanize their noses. It's, the hips are rather difficult. <laughs> but it's struggling with that issue, what it means to be beautiful worthy of desire, cuts deep, very deep. Similarly so in terms of attacks on black intelligence. Of course, the bell curve, Chuck Murray and the late Richard Herrnstein, but one part of a cycle in this regard. In fact, as the brothers in the barbershop remind us, you know, in the 18th century, they said no black person had no intelligence whatsoever. In the 19th century, said a few had a little intelligence. Now they say all of us have less than average intelligence. We're making progress. <laughs> We're making great progress on white supremacist criteria. But of course, you come back and remind people of African descent, what do you think most British intellectuals have said about the intelligence of Irish brothers and sisters after 500 years of British colonialism and imperialism? You don't hold your breath. What do you think most male intellectuals have said about sisters' intelligence of all colors for over 2,000 years, yet don't hold your breath? What do you think Christian theologians have said about Jewish moral character given the weight and gravity of anti-Semitism in the practice of Christian churches, yet don't hold your breath? The context is so tendentious. The framework is already so biased. The way in which the question is asked is already predicated on certain assumptions and presuppositions deeply entrenched and immersed in that history. It doesn't mean you give up on high quality scholarly inquiry. The debate must go on. We must have uninhibited and robust discourse. I'm a libertarian on these issues. <laughs> it's true. Because I'm a Democrat. Small d. <laughs> uh, school of government got to make that clear. <laughs> but the point Du Bois is getting at is how difficult it is to conceive of black people as individuals and persons rather than abstractions and objects. How difficult it is to actually see black people, to use the metaphor of the great Ralph 
Waldo Ellison, an invisible man. And how ironic it is that black folk find themselves with the epidermal that's most visible, their humanity invisible. How ironic it is in a condition of invisibility, black folk find themselves as objects of excessive surveillance. Police, the whip, the tree, the history of black folk in America. 244 years of inherited chattel slavery, subject to the brutal contingency of the slave auction, subject to violent punishment and vicious put down. That's a long time. 11 years in the sun, reconstruction. Thank God that that is Stevens and Wendell Phillips, who now the statues there in public garden led the fight for democratic inclusion. And you know, that was a great moment in the history of the human adventure when in fact, for the first time in the world, an enslaved people were actually ascribed citizens' rights in one generation. It was America's chance to become a serious and substantive democracy, not a heron folk democracy for white brothers and sisters only. But we blew it. Of course, during that time, we had more black senators then than we do now. We blew it. We had to wait for another 87 years of an institutional terrorism called Jim Crow and Jane Crow. And for 51 years, every two and a half days, some black child, a black man, a black woman was hanging from some tree, that strange fruit, the southern trees bear that Billy Holiday sang about. Part of the history. You know, we often overlook the great Abe Lincoln meant when he said, you know, we will either nobly save or meanly lose this last best hope of Earth. He didn't say on Earth, he said of Earth. He was a Democrat in his bones, not just his mind. It had ontological meaning for him. But in that same speech, December 1st, 1862, the Congress, he had said, America cannot escape history. That's what it means to force a hotel civilization to grapple with the problem of evil. And of course, Abe Lincoln was one of the few, given all of his flaws as well as his virtues, that force us as a national community to grapple with the problem of evil. And Du Bois is trying to do the same thing in the souls of black folk. Why? Because Du Bois understood, as did Abe Lincoln, that democracy was one of the most precious ideals of humankind. It's the best thing that we featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creatures born between urine and feces have ever come up with. What do I mean by democracy? Well, as you can imagine, there's so many different definitions and theories and so forth. Let me begin with that brother who used to play organ in my church. We knew him as Sylvester, but he's known to the world for the genius that he is. His name is Sly Stone. He wrote a song called Everyday People. Everybody is a star. What do you mean by that? The deep democratic sensibility. This notion that each and every one of us were unique and singular and distinctive and irreproducible and irreplaceable. We each have equal value in the eyes of something, God, law. And that equal value means that each one of our lives have epic significance, even though we know that we face inescapable and unavoidable and inevitable extinction someday very soon. And in that short time, as we try to find a little meaning and value and a little love and care, the idea we everyday people govern ourselves and manage ourselves is a deeply simple yet subversive ideal. The way Blinken used to say, God must love common folk, God made so many of them. <laughs> but he also said, self-government is better than good government. Plato shakes in his grave one of the most, if not the most profound critic of democracy, the aristocrat that he was, we learned much from his criticisms. But the idea that we would make Pascalian wages on the mental and moral capacities of everyday people to govern themselves, where did that come from? 
What makes you think that they won't make a mess of things? Isn't it the case that the history of the human adventure, for the most part, is a history of coercing and forcing everyday people to defer to some set of unaccountable elites? Kings and queens and princes and prelates and magistrates and potentates and lords and earls and squires and suzerains, dot, dot, dot. Is that not the history of the human adventure? Rulers and subjects, who thinks that this precious notion of citizenship, everyday people capable of ruling or being ruled in turn, which then puts an emphasis on the alternation of rule and the rotation of rulers. This idea that there are Promethean energy shot through the lives of everyday folk that could produce unprecedented possibilities heretofore ignored, downplayed, overlooked, a democratic idea. Or well, to put it another way, who would believe that we human beings can actually sustain the sublimation and transformation of our primitive aggressions and paranoid dispositions cast it in such a way that we can sustain regimes of nonviolent competition and civic cooperation. That's the problematic. Is it possible? It's no accident that democracies are so rare in human history. And when they come along, they tend to be short-lived. They don't last that long. Our aggression is too overwhelming. Our paranoia, too overweening. The bonds of trust, too weak. Because keep in mind, citizenship is not some abstract notion. Citizenship is a transformed energy of kinship. The great genius of Cleisthenes in 508 was what? To shift kinship bonds from birth to residence. That's what the demons were about. It's the basis of democratic bonding, the basis of democratic identity. Is it possible that kinship networks that sustain us, provide protection, a sense of self and purpose, can be transformed in such a way that we experience an ascent of allegiance to something bigger than the tribe, the clan, the race, the gender, maybe even the nation? Aristocrats have good reason to look at we Democrats and say, you naive optimists, don't you know what you're up against? Don't you know that every society that we know has some sacrificial group? Don't you know every society we know is predicated not simply on some barbarism, but on some subjugation and subordination of a peoples? That's a very deep question, very deep question a lot of time with black nationalists. The legacy of Marcus Garvey, Elijah Muhammad, Minister Louis Farrakhan, a whole host of others. And their argument is what? Their argument is that America does not have the capacity to treat black people kindly and legally, and legally equal. The rape of supremacy is too deep. That American democracy itself is predicated on black put down and subordination. And any time America raises a question of multiracial democracy, it's never a serious one. It will not last because very much like Athenian democracy that was predicated on imperial expansion and patriarchal households and residential aliens like Aristotle who could not vote, that the structural limit of American democracy is race. And that therefore, very much like Jewish brothers and sisters in Jew-hating Europe, one ought to just leave. It's no accident Marcus Garvey's led the largest mass movement in the history of black people in this country with one fundamental aim, to get the hell out. And most people in other parts of the world can't understand that we can't wait to get to America, land of liberty and opportunity. Why do these folk want to leave? Then we read that line in Josephine Baker's memoir, the idea of America makes me shake and tremble and gives me nightmares. We say, my God, that's what Jews said about the Ukraine, and that's what the Irish said about the British, and that's what the Kurds say in the Middle East. How can anyone say that about America? I think you've got your analysis wrong. It's a much friendlier place than you think. 
black nationalists say, really? So we've read our Alexis de Tocqueville, a very different set of lens than Brother Newt Gingrich. Because we read that last chapter in volume one. Those three races that inhabit this land who are in America, but not of American democracy, indigenous people, and black folk. And so the name glows, especially the Irish at that time being demeaned and dehumanized. And of course, the Tocqueville reached the conclusion what? There will never be a multiracial democracy in America. Why? Because the bonding will never be deep enough, because the levels of polarization and balkanization and fragmentation will always shatter the body politic and not allow us to have a public life together. That's the challenge. Now again, as the Democrat small d, I respond to the legacy of Garvey and Elijah Muhammad, Mr. Louis Farrakhan, by taking quite seriously the argument, but viewing it as a challenge rather than a conclusion. It might be the case that race is a structural limit of American civilization, and therefore, like all civilizations, the ebb and flow would begin to disintegrate, dissolve, decompose slowly over time because we have been unable to deal not just with this problem, but with the problem of evil in all of its various forms and think we can just muddle through. That's a possibility. And we see escalation of what? Hysteria. Because the unraveling Every, every democracy that we know usually takes the form of two fatal viruses, poverty and paranoia. Increasing poverty, generating escalating levels of despair, overwhelming despair, and there never be enough police and prisons to deal with overwhelming despair. And paranoia, increasing paranoia, producing escalating levels of distrust, suspicion. And a distrust and suspicion makes it difficult for us to conceive of ourselves as citizens, something that allows us to transcend our sense of being bearers of identity, or our sense of being clients of a constituency. But citizenship, inhabiting public space, and engaging in public deliberation, mediated with mutual respect and civility, yes, but also recognizing in a democratic experiment, we're all on the same ship, and if that ship has a huge leak in it on a turbulent sea, in the end, we go up together, or we go down together, no matter where we are on that ship. But once you lose that sense, you think like Voltaire's Candide, you can just cultivate your own garden and stay in your privatistic cocoon. I set up that security system in the vanilla suburbs strong enough to hold out and hold at arm's length the escalating criminal behavior. You're losing a sense of what it is to be in it together. We often invoke uh, Rodney King's question, can we get along? Well, Brother Rodney had another insight that we often overlook. Before that question, he said, we are all stuck together for a while. That's much more important than the question, can we get along? Because if we're stuck together for a while, well, as what the other king, Brother Martin, used to say, we're part of one garment of destiny, one inescapable network of mutuality. If that's true, then if we don't reconstitute public space, make public life attractive and appealing, not excessively celebrate, romanticize, or idealize it, but recognize there are bonds and links and relations that hold us together. And if they don't hold us together, we see the degree to which we're still linked because we all in the end go down together. Different degrees, yes. And different disproportionate pain, yes. But still linked together. And I must say, when I look at the state of American democracy, I conclude we're living one of the most frightening and terrifying moments in the history of this nation. Unprecedentedly for linkage, relative economic decline, undeniable cultural decay, a sense of political lethargy, depression like levels of unemployment and underemployment in our chocolate cities, a middle class experiencing shrinking slots and therefore open the scapegoating more readily, downsizing of corporations, and of course the redistribution of wealth still going on upward. 1% of the population now owning 48% of the total net financial wealth. 1% of the population owning 40% of the household wealth. Thank God for Frank Levy of MIT and Edward Wolf of NYU to alert us, even the New York Times, put it on the front page. I say glory, hallelujah. <laughs> we need a debate 
about the degree to which our economy in terms of wealth distribution looks oligarchic, plutocratic, to some degree pigmentocratic. <laughs> At a time in which 25% of all American children live in poverty, 42% of brown young brothers and sisters under 10 live in poverty, 51% of black kids living in utter poverty in a nation predicated on a promise, but they have no sense of a future. 21% of our labor force working more than 40 hours a week, not receiving one penny from the federal government, but still living in poverty, called the working poor, another invisible group that cuts across race and region. It's impossible in the long run to hold together a public community. John Dewey said it so well in his classic of 1927, The Public and Its Problems. Show me a democracy in which levels of polarization are at work in which especially they are losing the art of public conversation where they're more and more unable to communicate with one another in which public conversation degenerates into name calling and finger pointing and I'll show you a democracy in decay. And of course that relative economic decline is not identical but it is inseparable from undeniable cultural decay, fear, violent attack, vicious assault, petty put down more clearly, and we see this, of course, in the decline of every civilization, the most civilizations going all the way back to the Sumerians of Mesopotamia, the Egyptians of Northern Africa, and that is this, the relative erosion of the systems of nurturing and caring with devastating impact on children. Devastating impact on children. That culture of decay has much to do with what it means to live in a market culture, very different than a market economy. Culture evolves around buying and selling and promoting and advertising with its market moralities, hedonistic, narcissistic, market mentality. I want power, pleasure, property now by any means. Give it to me. The ultimate logic of a market culture is gangsterization of culture. And gangsterization has to do, of course, precisely with calling into question the very conditions for the possibility of democracy. Those precious individual rights and personal liberty, the freedom of speech and worship and movement and association, and the rule of law and due process and fair trial. And the jury system, of course, is always a training ground for citizenship, and we see the state of our jury system manifest not simply in the OJ trial, but in a whole host of other trials as well, with the polarization reflected in public deliberation within the judicial system. We know how precious kind of majoritarian institutions in a democracy are because democracy is not mob rule, it's not tyranny of the majority. It's about everyday people feeling as if they have a say in the decision-making processes in those institutions that affect their lives. When those representative institutions seem hemorrhaged, seem blocked, then apathy, indifference sets in. And sadly, in terms of our political lethargy, we see politics become more and more market politics. Let me tell you my deepest convictions after I take a poll. See what they say. See where the wind is blowing. Thermometer politicians rather than thermostat politicians. Tell me what the climate of opinion is rather than let me shape the climate of opinion. Let me be a state's person and let you have a sense of what my vision is, and what my analysis is. And I'll be there fighting for it regardless of what the polls say. Right? Something called courage. Anyway. And my special word, if I have one for the graduates of this grand institution is that one, more than anything else, we're going to need something profoundly un-American if we're going to make it out of this, this quagmire, this crisis. And that's a sense of history. A very, very deep sense of history. A tragic sense of history. A subtle, sophisticated sense of history that builds on the ambiguous legacies of this experience. And the heterogeneous heritages. No Manichaean thinking, no all good on one side, all bad on the other but a sense of history that tries to generate non-market values in a market society. Non-market values like 
love and care and concern. It's difficult to talk about love these days, I, I know, but I'm talking about love the way James Baldwin talked about it. It's something daring and difficult and that pushes us as well as empowers others. Non-market values like public service, non-market values like community and fidelity, and most importantly, trust. And even in our intimate lives, non-market values like kindness and sweetness and gentleness and tenderness it affects every dimension of our lives to live at this particular moment in an American democracy that seems to be in deep, deep trouble. More than anything else, with the sense of history, and non-market values like empathy and sympathy and compassion, rooted in a sense of complexity in relation to past and present. We need courage. And by courage, I just don't mean someone standing up for their convictions, but also having the, the courage to attack your convictions. You could be wrong. I'm sure students have been told over and over again the unexamined life is not worth living. Socrates is right. But always recall, Socrates argued and Jesus wept. Socrates hardly laughs or cries because he's not in touch with enough pain. He didn't understand the depths from which art flows. Nietzsche's great critique of Socrates and the birth of tragedy. Nietzsche's absolutely right. That's why it's not just a matter of noting that unexamined life is not worth living, but the examined life is painful. That's the other side of it. It's going to hurt. It's going to create discomfort in a culture of comfort and convenience and a hotel civilization is looking for prosperity without acknowledging the pain that goes with it or the pain that it's often serves as foundation for it. You see. And last but not least, in addition to a sense of history and expansion of scope of empathy and sympathy and compassion and courage in the form of criticism and self-criticism and self-correction, we're going to need a whole new wave of public servants, leaders and followers, who are able to generate a sense of audacious hope. And by audacious hope, I don't mean optimism. I am in no way optimistic about America. How can anyone be optimistic in this barbaric century? There's not enough evidence out there that allows us to infer that things are going to get better. But I am a prisoner of hope. That is something else. And a prisoner of hope looks at the evidence, makes a leap of faith beyond the evidence, tries to energize and galvanize fellow citizens and fellow human beings to create new evidence in the form of vision and analysis and practice. And that's the best we human beings have ever been able to do, to believe that the world's incomplete in the future. It's open-ended. That what we do and what we think can make a difference. Or in the words of old learned hand, that great skeptic and towering judge, at the end of his great essay of 1932, Democracy and Its Presumptions, he says, you know, even a skeptic like me must believe that it's always dawn, that day breaks forever and above the eastern horizon. Somewhere at this very moment, the sun is about to peep. And all one needs is just that little crack of possibility, or as Bobby Seale puts it, seizing the time. And different ways of public service and public action and public leadership in America emerge precisely at the moment when it looks as if we're sliding down a slippery slope to anarchy and chaos. And I hope and pray that there'll be those that many, most, all, the class of 1995 will attempt to meet this challenge in your own distinctive way that you, like earth, wind, and fire, will keep your heads to the sky. I like Mahalia Jackson, that you keep your hands on the plow even when what you engage in takes the form of unadvertised service. Nobody sees it. You're just trying to do the right thing. 
or the Freedom Fighters of the 1960s used to say, keep your eyes not so much on each other, not on your own inadequacies and shortcomings. We all have many. Keep your eyes on the prize, something bigger than you, something grander than you, something that can appeal to the better angels of your nature, the best of who you are at a moment in which the worst and each and every one of us being accented. And maybe then we'll at least have a chance. T.S. Eliot says in the four quartets, Ours is in the trying, the rest is not our business. We're not going to save the world ourselves or the nation, but we can leave it just a little bit better. Or as my grandmother used to remind me, if the kingdom of God is within you, then everywhere you go, you ought to leave a little heaven behind. And that's what I'm asking the class of 1995. And I can simply say for those willing to meet this challenge, I'll be there with you because I'm going down fighting. Thank you all so very much. Two things to say. One, that uh, fortunately for us, while this is a commencement address in a sense selected by the students, there is, we won't have a usual question and answer session, but there is a reception sponsored by the Office of Alumni Affairs, and our speaker will stay with us uh, for a little while to chat with folks. Secondly, uh, most of us go through life hoping that we'll be eloquent enough to conceal the fact that our ideas aren't all that good, <laughs> or hoping that our ideas are sufficiently good that they'll cover our lack of eloquence. Uh, Cornell West doesn't have to worry about either of those. Thank you. <laughs>